بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي امري واحلل عقدة من لساني يفقه قولي بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على سيدنا وحبيب قلوبنا وشفيع نفوسنا أبا القاسم محمد وعلى آل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين لا سيما بقية الله روحي وأرواح العالمين لتراب مقدمه الفداء Ama Ba'ad, respected scholars, elders, brothers and sisters, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. First and foremost, as we are in the last night of the holy month of Ramadan, insha'Allah, I'd like to wish everyone from the pulpits a blessed and Eid Mubarak, insha'Allah, for the upcoming day. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us all Longevity and long life, inshallah, to all be under this roof once again next year to celebrate Eid together and also go within Ramadan and elevate ourselves both in a spiritual level and a physical level once again. So, for the blessing of this month, inshallah, we'd like to first and foremost raise our voices in a loud salawat ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. The topic that I've chosen for tonight is, inshallah, a conclusive topic. A topic where, inshallah, where we can not look at the individual aspects in which we looked at throughout the month of Ramadan, of the holy month of Ramadan, but in to take into perspective everything that we have learned and try to see within ourselves how is it that we can learn from this holy month? How is it that we can come in the next month and say to ourselves, well, you know what, we've learned this, we've applied it throughout the 11 months and until, inshallah until we get to the next month of Ramadan we again rehabilitate ourselves and gain and then again do it for the next upcoming year but how is it that we can do it on a simple level because I can come on the pulpit and I can say well you know what you have to do A, B, C, D but I'm not going to burden anyone I'm not someone to tell you how to become religious, what to study to become religious, which avenues to take to become religious. It's not my job. What I have is an opportunity to get each and every one of you, inshallah, today, and first and foremost myself, into thinking, how is it that I may reach closeness toward Allah? I may come forth and say, well, you have to read more Quran, but how do I know your particular perspective? How do I know how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will want you to gain leanness to Him? There are so many doors that you may reach towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And many people come to many problems and many stones that they can't overcome because they try to overburden themselves. So tonight, inshallah, I want to look at two perspectives, and then we want to conclude it for the month of Ramadan. Number one, when someone makes that step, when someone wants to go towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and especially within this month, as we draw this month to a close, how is it that we can gain everything that we've learned this month, everything that we want to apply to our lives, and actually apply it within the remainder of the year until next Ramadan comes? And again, the spiritual revive happens. Because some people come forth and they see, they learn, they understand, they comprehend. However, what? They try to burden themselves. How? They say, well, you know what? I was so inspired by this holy month. I was taken back at the Quran recitation, for example. I want to, from tomorrow, read a whole juzu every single day. Some people may come forth and say, I want to read the whole Quran every single day. People have, we thrive of that. When we think to ourselves, well, we can achieve this. But it becomes a negative aspect when we don't meet that criteria. When we say we want to do this, but we don't end up doing it because it becomes a burden. Why? Because we don't know to ourselves the capacity in which we are able to do. I'll give you an example. I'll give you an example. Imam... Ali السلام, has a beautiful statement. He says, that which is very little but constant 
is better than that which is crowded, but only for a significant time period. Meaning what? And we want to put it in our perspective. If we go and read one juzu every single day for the rest of our lives, that's perfect. Without a shadow of doubt. But if you've never read one juzu before then, and then you start from tomorrow, you want to read one juzu every day. Some people may do it. Those are the lucky people. But the majority of people won't be able to keep in touch with one juzu, for example, every single day for the rest of their life. That's why the Imams make it simplified. What do they make the mustahab? Imam Sadiq has a narration that says 55 verses of the Holy Quran is the mustahab on a daily perspective. 55 verses, some of them it's in one page. Others it's two pages, which is one double-sided page. It says that's sufficed. You read that and the Imam has so many rewards in, in, in touch with that. Reading the Quran has so many rewards. When you read the Quran, it strengthens your eyesight. It strengthens your memory amongst many others. He tells you just 55 verses. Why? Because it's taking you into an aspect. Don't overburden yourself. When you want to come towards religiosity, when you want to come towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, yes, there's a long way to go. The more you learn, the more you realize, the less you know. As in you ask the knowledgeable people, the people that, are, that have knowledge, not someone like me. You ask people that have knowledge, you ask them. You ask them, what do you know and how much do you know? And the truly humble people will tell you, I know nothing. Even though we look at them and say, what amazing statuses they've reached because of their knowledge. You ask them, they say, I don't know anything. That's humbleness. That's what happens when you know the knowledge of Ahlul Bayt and how much you ever want to learn or strive towards learning. You'll never be enough. Never be suffice in their knowledge. Imam Sadiq says, every knowledge that you have on this earth is an elif that's not even complete. And we strive towards that. But the aspect I want to focus on tonight is let's take tonight as an aspect in which we can learn ourselves that yes, we have a goal. We have to identify the goal. We know what we're lacking. I can't tell each and every one who, what we're lacking. I have to first and foremost tell myself that I am lacking A, B, C, D. My weaknesses are A, B, C, D. My strengths are A, B, C, D. I have to work on my strength and my weaknesses, not just my weaknesses. That which is strong, let me make it stronger. Don't ever think to yourself that I've sufficed, it's enough in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because once you do, that's when you begin to downfall. When you reach that state of arrogance, like Iblis, what happened? 6,000 years he's in Jannah and he's, he's in, in the skies, in the heavens, and he's prostrating towards Allah. 6,000 years, one moment of downfall, one moment of arrogance, he goes all the way down. One moment. Now to ourselves, that's what we have to learn. As high ranks as we reach, as much worship as we can do, it's never enough in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. To an impact so much so, that when you say alhamdulillah, for breathing, you have to say it twice. Why? Because you're breathing out and you're breathing in. He says, that, that's the simplified account that you can never thank Allah enough. If every single breath you take, you say, Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah, it's not enough. Because you have to say it every, every single time, twice. You'll never reach an aspect which you can thank Allah enough for what blessings He has given us. That's why we have to strive towards perfection. Strive into holding on to the ropes of Allah. So that's the first perspective. Is always... Think that I have an end goal and write to yourself how I can reach that end goal in a step-by-step -step process. No one can ever run before they walk. We have these signs. No one can, can ever run before they walk. No one can speak fluently before they learn the alphabets. One letter at a time. You don't burden yourself. These are the aspects that they give us. So that's number one I want to take from the lectures throughout the month of Ramadan is let's look at first and foremost what we want to become next Ramadan. Write it within yourself. Write it down if you have to. Put the dot points. Say what you want to be. Even if it's as small but effective as praying on time for the next year. Look how much your life will change. Something so simple but effective. Small portions. If you read one verse 
every day. Just one verse of the Holy Quran for the rest of the year until next Ramadan, that suffices. If that's what you want, if that's what you want to achieve, it's all to do with you, your capacity. You're more knowledgeable about yourself, about your organized skills, your organized daily routines. So number one, organization, do not overburden yourself. Because if you overburden yourself, you reach a state where you don't want to do anything whatsoever. You'll get fed up, you'll think it's too much, it's too much. Simplify, simplify it and you will reach a stage where you know that I can add more on my daily routine. So that's number one. Number two, and this is one that each and every one of us has to understand in depth. Because many of us think to ourselves, when we look at people that are great, when we look at people that have reached particular ranks, when we look at people that have achieved all that which they have achieved, we look at ourselves in comparison to them and say, well, I'm nothing. I'm nothing. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says one of the greatest sins is to have yes. Yes means what? It means you believe that there is no one on earth that can be of assistance or you're worthless and Allah will never help you. Allah doesn't exist. People go and commit suicide because they don't believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because they don't believe in a way. That's the lowest rank when you can reach when you don't believe in yourself. Ali ibn Abi Talib has a beautiful statement. And it's a, very, it's a long statement, but we want to take one particular analogy. Ali ibn Abi Talib starts a narration by saying, he says, your sickness, and it can be taken in many different aspects, but I'm not going to go into the bahath for that tonight. What I want to look at is the gist of this particular narration. In the aspect that we want to look at, belittling ourselves, or knowing that we are capable of doing anything if we set our mind to it. He says, your sickness is from you. Look at the wordings of Ali He says, your sickness is from you, but you do not perceive it. He says, your remedy is within you, but you do not see it. Then he goes on to say what? You think you are but a small entity. That's where we want to get at tonight. You think you're nothing. Some people may come forth and say, well, you know, I can never achieve such a thing. I can never be great. I can never be of the companions of Imam Sahib al-Asri was zaman I can never let Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala even look at me because of my sins. He says, you think you are but a small entity. Then what does he say, Ali Talib? He says, but within you, the entire universe unfolds. Comprehend that. Reminisce over the words of Ali ibn Abi Talib. He says, you think you're a small entity, whereas within you, the entire universe is unfolding. What kind of knowledge has Allah instilled in us? What kind of achievements can someone that's a humble servant of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala achieve? If only he listens to Allah and stays away from that which is haram. And does that which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants him to do. There's only a handful of things that are haram. Why is it that because of secular societies, because of the media, because of what the magazines tell us it's cool, we have to go towards that which is haram. Handful of things. Handful of things. People come and attack us. Going, well, Islam doesn't allow you to do A, B, and C. Handful of things that will affect us in a negative way. It won't affect Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's what you have to understand. So that's the second level. Allah teaches one of his prophets this particular aspect. He teaches us that each and every individual has a place, has love that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has for that person. Whether he be a Muslim or not a Muslim, of course. Why? Because that person, you never look at him and say, well, you know what, he's not even part of our religion. He's not even believing in Allah. You say to yourself, that's a person that can believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's a person, if he has qualities and characteristics, if he was to believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and hold on to the rope of Allah, which is the Ahlul Bayt, I believe he can be great. Look, in a positive sense, people come forth with Ali ibn Abi Talib, the companions of Ali. They go past the church and they look at the church and they look at Ali ibn Abi Talib. And they say, oh Ali, 
Look at this church. Look how much Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was looked down upon in this particular church. Look how much kufr was in this church. Ayyam Talib looks at that person and says, why do you say that? Why is it that you do not say that look at how much Allah was glorified in this church? Why always look at the negatives? Look at the positives within yourself. Look at how you can achieve greatness. Don't think to yourself, well, I've done this sin. I might as well not repent because Allah won't forgive me anyway. The greatest door towards Allah is the door of Tawbah. What better day or what better month to repent than this month? And it's the last day of this month. Let's put it into practice before tomorrow, Eid. What do we celebrate? Do we celebrate that we fasted? That we've removed food and drinks? Or do we celebrate that we've achieved a whole month? One whole month obeying Allah, staying away not only from that which is haram, but also encompassing ourselves to stay away from that which is halal. If we can do that for one month, why is it we can't do it for the rest of the year? That's why we celebrate. Because we can achieve. We have greatness within us, but we overlook it. Nabi Allah Nuh, after the flood occurred and the kuffar all died. Nabi Allah Nuh, as you know, all of our anbiya, our ma'sumin, obviously they had jobs. They weren't just preaching. Each and every one of them had a particular thing that they used to do, a trade, a job, working, giving us an aspect that you know what, you have to go and earn. Nabi Allah Nuh, we used to work with pottery, we used to make vases, ornaments. So two people, after the flood occurred, two people comes into, into his shop. They come and buy everything of Nabi Allah Nuh. Everything they buy it. Nabi Allah Nuh, imagine what he's thinking. He's like, these guys really like my stuff. They buy everything from Nabi Allah Nuh. They take it. Nabi Allah Nuh sells it. He's, he's excited. Why? Well, who wouldn't be? Look at the aspect. They take everything that they bought outside. And they begin to break it. They bought it, they start breaking it outside. Nabi Allah Nuh, they sold it. He doesn't have possession over it, but he's still hurt. Why? Because he says, I've spent time on this. These are my works. I've spent valuable time. I have a connection with these particular ornaments. I'm proud of these particular ornaments. Those two people reveal themselves. And they said, Oh Nabi Allah, we are angels sent from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to teach you a lesson. He says, what's the lesson? What wisdom do you wish to teach me? He says, Oh Nabi Allah Nuh. He says, when you raised your hands after 950 years, as the Quran states, 1,000 minus 50, as the Quran states, after 950 years of da'wah, you raised your hands and said, Allah, bring down your anger or bring down your adab on these people because I have done that which is enough. Ali ibn Talib has a reference with Nabi Allah Nuh. Because after 950 years, he says, I can't give da'wah anymore. These people don't have a chance. These people don't want to come towards the religion. Ali ibn Talib was in comparison to Nabi Allah Nuh. He says, Nabi Allah Nuh, after 950 years, he was fed up with his people. He, he did enough. He didn't want to do more da'wah. He says, these people will never learn. Ali ibn Talib in that reference says, if I was given to eternity, I would never stop preaching. Ali ibn Abi Talib not only preached to the humans. How many narrations do we have when he went towards the jinn in the underground tunnels and fought with them? How many people did he bring towards? How many jinn did he bring towards Islam? Da'wah, da'wah, da'wah. He was a living manifestation of the Quran. Everywhere he walked, the way he talked, the way he attributed himself with other people. They didn't even know it was Ali ibn Abi Talib. Until someone else told them. People used to admire his character. Why? Because he didn't want to tell people that I am such and such. He taught us yesterday, we discussed, know the truth and you'll know its people. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was trying to teach Nabi Allah Nuh that each and every human 
that was drowned in the flood could have come towards Islam had a value. When we look at it within ourselves, each and every one of us, we have a value in the eyes of Allah. Within ourselves, we can become like Shimur by one action or we can become like Hussein. Something as simple as choosing the right path. Simple, simple aspects. It doesn't have to be a world-shattering decision where you have to choose. If you start with the small decisions, small decisions, obeying or disobeying, going with those particular peas towards something which is haram or something which may be haram or may occur that is haram or staying away. Simple decisions on a step-by-step -step platter. So when we reach the big decisions we already had under our belt that we've always chosen the right path. Do you think in the big decisions we'll choose wrong? Small steps. So when the big test comes, you know what to choose. Imam Sahib al-Asri wa zaman when we look at this aspect, because what do you want to achieve? I want each and every one of you to think of one concept. Think of a concept. It's not in religiosity. It's not, nothing to do with religiosity. I want to look at your goals. If Allah was to say, if Allah was to say, I will grant each and every one of you tonight one wish. What would you wish for? It's not bound by time, space. It's not bound. Anything that you want. What would you choose? What would you choose? Many people that I've asked, they said, well, I want to be of the Imam Sahib al-Asr wa zamans army. Many people. And I'm sure each and every one of us would love that. But you've got to remember, if that's the one wish that you do want, if that's the one goal that you want to achieve, because remember, you have this only one goal, one wish from Allah, what would you choose? Think about it. Now, if your answer is to be a part of the soldiers of Imam Sahib al-Asri wa zaman you don't need to wish, you need to act. Because it's achievable. That's the aspect. He says, I want to be of the companions. You can be of the companions. It's in your hands. Your actions will determine whether you'll be with or against the Imam. Because there were Muslims against, or weren't there Muslims against Imam al Hussein on the 10th of Muharram? But because of their actions, their daily lifestyles, they were still Muslim in name. In practice, they weren't. 30,000 of them opposed the Imam of their time. Only 72 were hand in hand because they made the right choices within their life. They knew who the rope of Allah was. And that's the aspect, brothers and sisters, that we need to learn from tonight. If we apply everything that we've learned in a small scale, in a daily perspective, we say something small like, you know what, I do this wrong. Let me try to do it right. I have an anger problem. Let me try to fix it. Let me take that in, com in, in comparison with what the imams have told me to do. If I am angry, if I'm sitting, I'll stand. If I'm stand, I'll sit. If that doesn't work, I'll make wudu. The cold water will affect. Simple aspect that may have a significant effect on your life. And we have to learn. That's the third aspect I want to, to learn from tonight. We have to learn from our imams. Remember what we said a few nights ago. We are of the luckiest people on this earth. Why? Because we did not have to search the entire world, the entire books, to come to the conclusion that this is the best religion and the most sought out. We were given it. We were gifted it. Allah gifted it to us. Other people have to search their entire life to know who Ali ibn Abi Talib is. They have to search their whole life to see what kind of mercy the Prophet of Islam was. They have to search their entire life. And when they hold on to this rope, not only Muslims, the people outside the religion of Islam, how many Christians do we know that have learned about Ali ibn Abi Talib? And they have the sword al fuqar hanging behind their house. Doors. Why? He says to remember what a great man he was. We want to teach our children to be like him. Even a Christian poet, what does he say? He says about Ali ibn Abi Talib. He says, don't say that Ali is only for the Shia. لا تقل شيعة هو تعليم. 
Don't say only the Shia love Ali. إن في كل منصف شيعيا هو فخر الإنسان لا فخر شعب اصطفاه وعده وليا. It's Christian man. He says, don't think that Ali is for a certain faculty or a certain group of people. Ali is for humanity. He's a Christian. He says, جل جل الحق في المسيحي حتى عد من فرط حبه علويا. Then he says, what? He says, أنا من يعشق البطولة والإلهام والحق والخلاق الرضية فإذا لم يكن علي نبيا فقد كان خلقه نبويا يا سماء اشهدي ويا أرض قري واخشعي إنني ذكرت عليا Christian man has that effect from Ali ibn Abi Talib. He says if he, Ali was not a prophet, his morals, his characteristics, his actual stances that he had were that of a prophet or were prophetic. He understood, his Christian man, he understood the position of Ali ibn Abi Talib. He understood the power that's installed into this man and how he can be a role model for the entire of mankind. That's what we have to hold on to, the rope of the Ahlul Bayt. We have to hold on to the rope. When we learn within these gatherings, when we are blessed to come towards these mosques in such holy months, such as the holy month of Ramadan, and inshallah when Muharram comes, and we gather once again, we have to remember these people, not only just by memory and uttering of the tongue and listening, doesn't want to come from this ear, goes at the other. We want to apply it. We want to say, Ali did this, I want to do that. Sayyidah Zainab had patience, I want to have patience. Sayyidah Zainab prayed Salatul Layl on the 11th of Muharram, I want to pray Salatul Layl from now on. The Imam has recited the Holy Quran better than anyone else, I want to begin to recite the Quran. Any example you want to apply to your life, there's, open the books and see. Patience, go look at Sayyidah Zainab. Stances, look at Imam Hussein. Bravery, courage, knowledge, look at Ali ibn Abi Talib, brotherhood. Look at Abu Fadl al-Abbas, motherhood. Look at Fatima al-Zahra. Mercy in its utmost manifestation. Look at the Prophet. Whatever lessons you want to learn, you'll find it in the household of Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. I've gone, I've gone over time for tonight and I apologize from the Sheikh. Apologies that I have gone over time, but it's inshallah, it's my last night that I'm blessed to be amongst such a beautiful gathering, and I want to end on a note in which I want to say that I, whatever I said that is correct, is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and from the, from the Imams, from the Prophet of Islam. Anything that I've said that's incorrect is solely from me. If I have offended anyone in any way, please forgive me in this holy month. And we pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that He brings this Ramadan again next year and we can all be amongst this gathering in the presence of Imam Sahib al-Asri wa zaman We want to pray to Allah to bless us and to accept our prayers and to give, and the last thing for tonight, to gift a surah al-Mubarakat al-Fatiha to all of those people that are of the Shia of Ahlul Bayt, all the Mu'mineen and Mu'minat, whoever has an inheritor to remember them and all those that do not have any inheritance to remember them, we want to gift them in this holy month and the last month and the last night of this month, of the holy month of Ramadan, a surah al-mubarakat al-fatiha, but before it, three of your loudest salawat, ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad.